This past week, I was channel surfing and came across a familiar old western. It's a classic, a modern classic, really, from the early days of Clint Eastwood. The movie Pale Rider was a major hit from 1985. The film opens in the California gold rush town of La Hood. A small group of poor prospectors is regularly abused, and some of them are even killed by the robber baron who operates the nearby town. In the opening scene of that movie, a teenage girl's pet dog is killed by the bandits. And as she buries her dog, she quotes the 23rd Psalm and whispers a brief but powerful prayer. Lord, if you don't help us, we're all going to die. Please, just one miracle. And with that, the camera turns to the beating hoof prints of a pale horse, a symbol of death from the pages of the book of the Revelation. And on that pale horse, Clint Eastwood's character comes riding in. And though the man on that pale horse enacts vengeance with a hickory axe handle, several cases of dynamite, and a trusty six-shooting revolver, the clerical collar that he wears makes him known throughout the movie simply by the nickname preacher. And it's because of that collar and the assumed ministerial calling that went with it, nobody suspected that the preacher was the answer to their prayer for deliverance. Now to be sure, Clint Eastwood's character acts and speaks in ways that are a far cry from a devoted follower of God. Nevertheless, in that movie, the preacher turned out to be exactly what they needed. And when we come to the opening ten verses of Judges 6, we find what could well be the biblical inspiration for that movie because as Israel cries out for a deliverer, God does in fact dispatch a messenger in verse 11 and recruits and enlists General Gideon to lead an army of freedom fighters. But first, we have to deal with these ten verses in which the Lord sits His people down on a church pew and calls a preacher forward to give them a prophetic tongue lashing. You may have even noticed the change in the intonation and inflection of my voice when I read from the text earlier, because most likely they were watching the horizon for another Othniel, perhaps another left-handed Ehud or a, or a or an ox goad wielder like Shamgar. Hey, at this point, they were brought so low that as the old song says, they ain't too proud to beg. They would have even taken another Lady Deborah or Sister J.L. But before we get too haughty or high-minded, we should be careful to examine our own lives against the narrative of this text because many are the times that God's people have called out for help only to find the Lord begins His holy assistance by setting you down so he can belt out a sermon. That is, sometimes before God gives you something, he wants to tell you something. Before he does something for you, he wants to say something to you. So while we should be very careful about writing ourselves into the biblical text of Scripture, there is an occasion, tonight I think is one, in which we'd all do well to see if there's an extra seat in this ancient service. And as the unnamed prophet preaches to them, let's eavesdrop on his little sermon and see if the preacher might be saying something to us tonight about when and why you and I need a preacher. The first thing that I notice is found in verses 1 through 5. It's the immoral practices of the people. Now once again, we see that when every man does that which is right in his own eyes, men, women, and boys and girls tend to do that which is wrong, at least wrong in the eyes of the Lord, whose eyes are the only ones that matter. And that sinful practice, that propensity is as old as the Garden of Eden. It did not start with ancient Israel, and it did not end with them. We still see immoral practices in the people of God today. That's the nation and the land in which we live. For example, this past week, the game show Jeopardy celebrated a female champion who they said has won more money and more games than any other woman in the history of that TV game show. The problem is, if you know the story, the female champion is not a female at all. Likewise, this week, Apple announced that in their new emoji update, they're going to include the emoji of a pregnant man. <laughs> 
There's no such thing, by the way, but I've seen the fictitious emoji. Quite frankly, it looks like an ugly male truck driver with a ponytail, a beer belly, and earrings. And we can lament the societal acceptance of such perversions, and rightly so, but we should never do so without being equally careful to look at our own lives for pride, greed, lying, bitterness, and all the other sins which so easily beset us. There's something I think we can learn from listening to this ancient unnamed prophet preach to the people about their immoral practices. For example, in verse 1, we read about the repetition of their sin. Our opening message in the book of Judges was a, a survey message I labeled deja vu all over again because the story of Judges, this, this Old Testament chronicling is the, is the story of the vicious cycle of sin, suffering, supplication, and salvation. And here we go in verse 1 on the latest spin around this terrible wicked merry-go-round that the sons of Israel once again did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. This really is in many ways another theme text for the book of Judges, for this phrase, this idea that, that, that Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. That phrase occurs twice in chapter 2, twice in chapter 3, once in chapter 4, and now we run into it again at the opening of chapter 6. Here's this incessant phrase that the inspired writer, most likely the prophet Samuel, uses again and again. Once again, here they go, repeating the same old wicked sinful practices. I will simply remind you that in the canon of Scripture, we're only in the seventh book of the Bible. You have the opening books of the Torah, the book of Joshua, and now the book of Judges. And Israel is doing the same thing that Adam and Eve and all of their sin-bound descendants have done ever since. I want to remind you of this because when we see God later in this book, and then in the later history of the nation of Israel, when God pours out strong and severe chastisement on the nation of Israel... Both in this book and in the books to come, we need never forget this is not their first rodeo. God has rebuked them and called them to repentance again and again and again and again and again. This falls right on the heels of the great victory song written by General Barak and Lady Deborah and sung by the people of God in the previous chapter. And then in what seems to be just a verse or two, of course, it's a span of 40 years, according to the closing verse of chapter 5. Israel falls right back into the repetitious cycle of immorality and sin. Dr. Barry Webb, in his commentary, notes that the pull of Canaanite worship was too strong. And Israel's resistance to it, already weakened by past lapses, Israel reverted to its old ways, and a dark shadow fell over the land again. Tonight, I simply want to say, whether you're in this room or watching by internet, if you find yourself constantly doing the same things over and over and over again, before you should expect anybody to reach down to you with some help, you better look for God to preach to you with some help. And He'll probably tell you that if you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, you can keep expecting to get the same thing over and over again too. The repetition of their sin. Note with me, secondly, still in verse 1, what I call the reason for their sin. For we believe that every word of God is inspired, including these conjunctions, like, such as the, 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 the first verse opens or begins with the word then. Some Bibles render that word as and. And the sons of Israel, or then the sons of Israel, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So we would do well to stop and ask, well, when was that? We'll look up one additional verse to the final phrase of chapter 5. And the land was undisturbed for 40 years. Four decades of peace. Forty years of blessing. Forty years of prosperity. Forty years of God pouring out blessing upon blessing upon blessing. And then the sons of Israel did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now by contrast to the liberals of our day, they would suggest that the problem with man is their environment. If you watch the evening news, if you scroll through your social media feed, you'd get the idea the reason people lie is because they are victims. The reason they assault is because they've been oppressed. 
The reason they murder is because there's no social justice. The reason that they rob and pillage and loot is because hundreds of years ago, their great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather was abused by someone. And so liberalism's answer is let's put clothes on his back, shoes on his feet, food in his belly, a roof over his head, an unemployment check in his pocket, and his innate goodness will burst forth like the noonday sun. But the narrative of Scripture could not be any clearer than it is right here. Man's ki- mankind's problem is not found out in the street. It's found in the mirror. The reason for their sin is not primarily external, though we deal with the temptations of the world and the devil as well as our flesh. The reason is on the inside. Now, we're going to see this more clearly in just a moment, but it's obvious that Israel at this point believes their problem is Midian. But Israel's problem is Israel. And it just may be that at this worship service in Judges 6, where the preacher spontaneously shows up, dusts off a spot, and begins to shuck the corn and shell the peas, somebody in the room might say, Brother Pastor, would you ask God to do something about Midian only to have the preacher respond on behalf of God and say, God wants to do something with Midian, but he's got to do something about you first. You see, they're in bondage, but it's not because Midian is so strong. They're in bondage because Israel is so sinful. There may be one in this service tonight crying out to God for help. You don't like the situation of your life, but you point the finger of blame. You, 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 You pass the buck and you shift the blame and you make excuses. And this text tonight would say you may not get any help from God until after you find yourself at a place of repentant prayer and say, it's not my brother, it's not my sister, but it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's not my mama, it's not my daddy, it's me. It's not my cousin, it's not my boss, it's not my neighbor, it's me. It's not my Sunday school teacher, it's not my gym coach, it's not my homeroom teacher, it's not my bus driver, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer, the repetition of their sin, the reason for their sin, verses 1 through 5 chronicle for us the result of their sin. We'll not take the time to reread the narrative, but God had given them this land. The great, great, many times great grandparents of these people had conquered the land of Canaan. They had won many victories with the sword and the spear on this very ground. And here are their descendants slinking around in fear of their life. The Bible says that they are cave dwellers, hiding out in the cracks and the crevices of the mountainside, living where the fox and the bears should be living. They come out to eke out a meager sustenance. And just as the blossoms come to the pea patch, just as the first waves of The barley harvest would begin to come in, so do the Midianites, swarming in like a swarm of locusts. They don't leave a single grape on the vine or a head of wheat in the field. How pitiful, how low. The Bible says that that Israel was brought low. What a sad state for the people of God who've had so much at their disposal, so much given to them, so much opportunity, so many blessings. And yet I must confess to you, without breaching anyone's confidence, I've seen this story play out in my own family, in my own ministry, and literally in my own office. People who have had everything going for them and practically anything and everything given to them. A great home, great kids, great job, great life. Now finding themselves slinking around on their belly because of sin. Ruined, undone, and wasted. Because of sin, and like the prodigal of Luke 15 living in the pig pen, the sons and daughters of God are not at all above having the consequences of their sin come crashing down on them in an avalanche of godly discipline. The results of their own sin. Through the years, on a few occasions, I've even had people call the office to find out what I was going to preach that Sunday. You see, they had some pagan family and friends in town for the weekend, and they want to be sure that their ungodly guests don't get confronted with their sin. 
And on those very rare occasions, I've wanted to tell them, I've wanted to tell them that I was preaching about the merciful majesty of the birth of sweet little Jesus boy. (laughs) Only to have them show up while I preach about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm talking about tender-hearted believers with no discernment who think that people who are in situations like those in Judges chapter 6, what they really need is a tender hand of compassion. That may be true. That may be true. But it may also be true that if you are living in sin away from God, that what you need is the Lord to set your sorry backside down in a Sunday school class and have a God-called teacher take the Word of God in their hand and cut you slap to the quick with the Word of God. What you may need is a Christian mama or a godly daddy to set you down at the breakfast table and rake you over the coals with the Word of God. Hey, what you may need is the Spirit of God to draw you to the house of God on the coldest Sunday night in a long, long time. To drop the Word of God through a divinely given sermon. Drop it on you like a hundred pound anvil falling on your toe to ask you, do I have your attention now? Do you hear me now? I've got something I want to say to you about the immoral practices of the people. Why you need a preacher. Number one, because of the immoral practices of the people. Secondly, because of the insufficient prayers from the people. Now, I've heard some weak prayer requests in my time. Lord, help me find my pet hamster. Lord, help my team win the ball game. By the way, as long as we're talking about football, time out on the field. God doesn't give a rip about the NFL playoffs. I once had a rebellious teenager come and confess something to me and then ask me to pray for them that their parents wouldn't find out about it. For starters and parents, you'll be grateful for this. Your teenagers confess something to me. I will be the fulfillment of the non-answer to that prayer. I'm not going to know more about your kids than you do. I'm talking about insufficient prayers, but none of them begin to rival the pitiful prayer requests we find in verses 6 and 7. Now, it sounds wonderful at first hearing, but when you listen more closely, something is desperately wrong with this prayer. And frankly, we get some indication of that just by the variance in the cycle of judges. Because the cycle again and again has been sin, suffering, supplication, salvation, sin, Suffering, supplication, salvation. But here we find sin, suffering, supplication, sermon. There's something different, something insufficient about the prayer that they pray about deliverance from the Midianites. Consider three things about this prayer's insufficiency. First, we see when they were miserable. Verse 6, so Israel was brought very low because of Midian, and the sons of Israel cried to the Lord. Now, when the main narrative of the book of Judges really opens in chapter 3, Israel was placed in bondage to the king of Mesopotamia for eight years, and then God delivered them, you will remember, at the hand of Othniel, and they had peace for 40 years. Follow, Follow the history for a moment. After that, they strayed, and God sold them to the Moabites for 18 years. Forty years of peace followed by 18 years of bondage. That's nearly 60 years that it took God to get their attention. Forty years the first time, 60 years the second time. And after left-handed Ehud delivered them from fat king Eglon, there were 80 years of peace followed by 20 years of oppression. 80 years of blessing, 20 years of oppression. And if I know anything about the people of God, and I know some things about the people of God, those 80 years of blessing were not 80 years of just absolutely walking with God. No, they were 80 years of drifting and straying and backsliding. That's what led to the 20 years of oppression before they began to cry out for deliverance. That means in that case it had been 100 years since they'd seen a genuine move from God, and when they began to cry out then, it was only because Judges 2 verse 3 says that Jabin, the king of Canaan, oppressed the people. What, what's the case here about when they were miserable? Forty years of blessing didn't make them grateful. Forty years of backsliding did not make them uneasy. One, two, three, four, five, six years of oppression at the hand of the Midianites 
did not take its full toll. But now somewhere around year seven, they're broke. And it's then and only then that they cry out. What a sad testimony against the people of God then and now. That the distance between our heart and the heart of God is not enough to drive us to a place of prayer. But God has to break us and bind us. God has to place us in the vice grip of difficult circumstances to get our attention. We, like they, often only get miserable when life circumstances find us in a mess. Their prayer is insufficient because of when they were miserable. That's closely connected to a second reason, and that's why they were motivated. For verse 7 says, they cried to the Lord on account of Midian. I point out again, they should have been crying to the Lord on account of Israel. They cried to the Lord on account of Midian. All they're motivated by, all they're concerned with is Midian. They don't care anything about their immoral practices. They don't seem to care anything about the fact that during those 40 years of blessing, once again, they they had no doubt begun giving their sons and daughters into these Canaanite pagan marriages. They, they, They didn't care anything at all about the fact that the nation had been plunged once again into idolatry. They don't care anything about their empty prayer clauses. All they care about is their empty wallet, their empty cupboards, and their empty bellies. God knows why they're coming with this prayer. Parents, you can relate to this. Sometimes when my kids come to me, I can tell merely by the tone of their voice they're coming because they want something. And so can God. Years ago when I was serving as the chaplain for our local high school football team, we, we lost a very close, tight playoff game. And after that, a young man came to me, helmet off, Tears streaming down his face, which is very understandable and appropriate after a tough loss like that one. But he said, Pastor Mike, I want to ask you something. Where was God? Why didn't God answer my prayer? What prayer? The prayer that we would win this game. Why didn't God answer my prayer? I tried to console him as best I could knowing that that was not a moment that we were going to have a deep theological Bible study. But I confess to you, what I wanted to say is he he probably wasn't listening to your prayer because you've been cussing his name for the last three hours. And that young man, like so many of God's people, act as if God is some kind of cosmic Santa Claus, some celestial A-team that rides in to save the day when you're in trouble. The idea of showing up to save you when you're in trouble has more in common with wonder pets than the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Here they find themselves in a tight, in a bind, and suddenly they're motivated to get out of a jam. Not bothered at all that their soul is in a mess, but just that their life is in a bind. Now I hesitate to say this to you because I know that in a group of this size, especially including our online audience, someone will take this the wrong way. But I'm going to ask God to help me communicate this clearly. There have been occasions in my nearly 20 years as your pastor, more than 25 years total on staff, that I've almost felt bad to see some people show up at church because of my history with them. It's not because I'm mad at them. It's not a legalistic condescension. It's born out of my love for them because I realize when I see them, most likely the cancer must be back. Most likely the daughter must be in jail again. Most likely the boy must be strung out on crystal meth again because it seems like the only thing that motivates them to be concerned about the supposed things of God It's when their life gets caught betwixt and between. Now don't get me wrong. It is good for us to call on the name of the Lord in those times. But just know this. When you call on the name of the Lord, He knows why you're calling. And in His sovereignty, He may choose to deal with your motive before He does anything about your mess. 
Their prayer was insufficient because of when they were miserable, why they were motivated, and because of what they were missing. In this brief little prayer that we find referenced in verses 6 and 7, there's not a hint of brokenness, not a scintilla of repentance, not the slightest suggestion that they kneel at an altar of prayer with a broken heart. In our vernacular, we would think of the person who is not sorry about their sin. They're just sorry that they got caught. As Paul would later teach the Corinthians, there is a sorrow that leads to repentance and there is a sorrow that leads to death. And God in His omniscience knows that if He delivers them without confronting them first, if they're saved without a sermon, turned loose without first being turned around, they would have been worse off than before. You see, the reason their prayer for deliverance is insufficient is they want God to do something for them, but God knows He first needs to do something in them. They need a preacher. And there are times in my life I need a preacher too because of the immoral practices of the people because of the insufficient prayers from the people. Thirdly, and in conclusion, we read about the inspired proclamation to the people. There's a brief transcript of the sermon found in verses 8, 9, and 10. Whoever this unnamed prophet is, he clearly preaches shorter messages than do I. But we've got to deal with the fact this, this may not be all of the sermon. This may just be the the inspired Cliff's Notes versions, the, the, the divine synopsis of the message. But even if verses 8 through 10 are just what sometimes I might post as the Sunday night preview on Facebook, there's enough for us to know it was a pretty hard sermon. And frankly, there's enough for us here to know the kind of proclamation we need in our lives, especially when we, like they, have strayed from God and from His paths of righteousness. Now, if you're honest, often after a tough sermon, we gather up in the hallway or the parking lot, maybe around the supper table or in a booth at the huddle house, and we quietly, with whispered voice, ask, what did you think about that sermon? Which usually is a fishing expedition for division. Otherwise, you would have said, wasn't that great? Boy, I needed that, but what did you think about that sermon? Well, rather than us asking one another what we think about the sermon in this text, let's just ask the text itself. What kind of sermon was it? Three things as I close this evening. Consider first how firm it was. Again, I wanted the inflection and tone of my voice to characterize what I believe was happening when this anonymous prophet shows up and begins to preach his sermon. Because when he showed up, I believe there was blood and guts all over the pulpit and the pew. For a very brief time, this little homily took names, but it did not take any prisoners. In other words, it's a full-throated revival message that may have been longer than what we have here, but there's no reason to think that any of the rest of it was any softer than this recap we have listed in the text. It was a firm message. You may not have liked it, but you would have left wondering what Brother Prophet was trying to say. By contrast, we live in a day where even many of God's people want milk toast, powder puff, weak kneed sermonettes that make them feel like they're a pretty good guy or a pretty good gal with just a few more hills to climb on the road to sanctification. Meanwhile, our dusty Bibles and our empty prayer closets testify what we really need is a leather lung preacher to stand up and speak up. The browser history on our phone and the broken homes in our family reveal we need a sermon that's a whole lot less Joel Osteen and a whole lot more John the Baptist. Amen goes in that spot right there. When the average church and the average Christian in America falls hook, line, and sinker for man-centered pragmatism in the pulpit, this is not a day for little dusted-off devotionals from the preacher. We need the man of God to take the blessed book of God and under the power of God just rear back and preach what thus saith the Lord. Now, I do my best to be as encouraging as possible. 
But I just want to say tonight, if the preaching of the Word of God always feels like a hammer, it may be because you're always living like a nail. How firm it was. I had a personal illustration of this just this past week. Monday evening, in fact, I believe it was, might have been Tuesday evening, our youngest child, Matthew, is playing rec league basketball. Nine-year-old basketball. Keep this in mind. Nine-year-old basketball. And I listened to his coach. I'm not trying to criticize him at all. In fact, I'm, I'm saying this is what we do with basketball coaches, but I've listened to him for weeks Bless those boys out, and I don't mean may the road rise to meet you. (laughs) What are you doing? Where are you going? He ain't 10 feet tall. Pass the ball where he can catch it. Do you want to play basketball or you want to count lilies in the, in the gym? What, what's the matter with you? Did you come to learn to play basketball or not? And parents sit back and think, hmm, that's a good coach right there. That's a good coach. <laughs> and I said to a member of our church, and by the way, I'm not saying that's not good coaching. I am saying that I pointed out to one of our members that was there, his son was on the other team. I said, I'm going to try that Sunday morning. I'm going to stand out on the sidewalk between the 9 o'clock service and the 10.30 service, and when you and your wife go slinking out trying to come to church but not stay for Sunday school, I'm going to yell out across the parking lot, what's the matter with you? What are you thinking? I'm inviting people to stay for Sunday school. Tell them how important it is for them to grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And now you're taking your kids after I just said that. Y'all are going to get in the car to go to the huddle house. What's the matter with you? Did you come to be a Christ follower or not? Or what if Brother Matt yells across the parking lot on Wednesday night? Hey, Johnny, you better have your Awana verse memorized next week or don't come back. We'll give your vest and your trophy to somebody who really wants to count for God. Now, I told you that in what I knew would be somewhat a humorous way, but I note that nobody was laughing Monday night at the gym. Because the only place that it seems downright ludicrous to be that serious about something is about at the only place and about the only thing that it would make any sense to be that serious about. How firm it was. Man, he doesn't take any prisoners. He just rears back and he preaches. How firm it was. Notice secondly how familiar it was. He simply says, that here's what God said, verse 8, I'm the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt, brought you out from the house of slavery. Verses 9 and 10 is just a repetition of a sermon that ought to sound familiar. One commentary I have on the book of Judges has a chapter on this that is entitled Cycles, Spirals, and Circles. It's just a description of the cyclical nature of the book of Judges. And my point here is just like Israel's sin, sorrow, and supplication ought to sound familiar, this sermon ought to have a ring of familiarity to it too. Sort of like your long-term pastor preaching at Christmas on the birth of Jesus or preaching about the Great Commission or soul winning. After 20 years as your pastor, the astute listener ought to say, I believe he said something like that before. And indeed, this prophetic sermon recorded in verses 8 through 10 is in fact a repeated sermon. But unlike the plagiarism scandals of our day, this repetition is perfectly allowable. Because the sermon that's repeated here was first delivered back in Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And it wasn't presented by any old preacher. It was indeed presented by an old preacher. He's so old, he was from everlasting to everlasting. For in Judges 2, verses 1 through 5, an angel showed up to deliver this sermon. And not just an angel, but the angel of the Lord a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
What the preacher is saying to them here in this text is simply what Jesus had already said to them. I point out the familiarity of this sermon simply to say the problem of sin has not changed and the solution for sin has not changed either. The better part of 200 years has lapsed between Judges chapter 2 and Judges chapter 6, but the problem is still the same, and the solution is still the same, and so the sermon is going to be the same. And if the Lord tarries in His return for His church 10,000 and 10,000 years from now, if faithful men of God are standing behind the sacred desk of God confronting the people, they're going to give the same solution. That's really the essence of all good preaching. To just stand up and open your mouth and tell the people what God has already said. And by the way, this is why you ought to be faithful. And I'm so thankful for your faithfulness you demonstrate tonight. But we ought to be faithful to preaching and teaching opportunities. On Wednesday night, to have our children in Awana. To have our students up under the proclamation of the Word of God. As I have listened to... Our student minister, Brother Josh, preached through the Gospel of John and the I Am sayings of Jesus. I haven't heard a one of them yet, and I I preach in places all across the country. I haven't heard a one of them yet that couldn't be preached on any major Bible conference anywhere in America. And we have that poured into the lives of our middle school and high school students each and every Wednesday night. And I know of Brother Richard's faithfulness on Wednesday night to teach the adult Bible study and of Sunday school teachers that that crisscross this campus on Sunday morning having prepared their heart and prepared their lesson to teach you the whole counsel of the Word of God. And I must tell you that one of the heartaches in my ministry, it's not manifested tonight, but one of the heartaches in my ministry is preparing a message and oftentimes knowing exactly what's going on in the hearts and lives and situations of God's people, and they are not there to hear what God has declared through His Word. Oh, the pain and sorrow and trouble that we could avoid if we would simply have heard the message the first time and not found ourselves in this mess and in this situation. How firm it was. How familiar it was. Finally, how faithful it was. How faithful it was. Verse 8, And the Lord sent a prophet to the sons of Israel, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. I've told you before about a man that I met at a graveside service. I'd never met him before. Didn't know him to the best of my knowledge. We'd never been in the same place at the same time. Long before COVID made us all a little bit leery about shaking hands, this was years and years and years ago, I walked up to him, extended my hand and offered a word of greeting. He clearly looked down at my hand with derision, shook his head no. He would not greet me. He would not shake my hand. That was a strange encounter because this was a man that I did not even know. I thought it odd that a man that I didn't know him and he didn't know me would refuse to speak to me. But as weird and mysterious as that is, a man that if I've ever offended him, I don't know about it, wouldn't speak to me. It is infinitely more mysterious and merciful that a God that I have offended with my actions and my attitudes would speak to me. I know what he says through his messenger here in this text is a hard word of rebuke. But it is dripping with mercy. It is dripping with grace that a people who by all standards had forfeited their right to hear from God or have God move and intercede on their behalf would, yes, later have that God raise up Gideon and deliver them from the oppressive hand of the Midianites, but first that he's actually going to have divine dialogue with them. Anything that he would say to them is a manifestation of mercy and love and grace. Because, beloved, when we have strayed from God, The worst thing that God could say to us is nothing. And the worst thing that God could do with us, for us, or to us is nothing. Dale Ralph Davis comments here that we should not miss the kindness of God in all this. 
One of the kindest things God does for us is to bring us under the criticism of His Word to expose the reasons for our helplessness and misery. This is exactly what the Lord Jesus did. He who came to preach and become deliverance to the captives. Long before He moved with a gracious act of deliverance on a bloody cross called Calvary. I remind you, He was a prophet priest and king. And before he did something, he said something. He said things like, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He said things like, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus is the perfect example This unnamed prophet is already following in his footsteps before Jesus even stepped on this earth. God sent one to preach, and that preaching was followed by deliverance. So tonight, if this message cuts you, please know this. God does not come as an intruder to cut you with a knife to hurt you. He comes as a great physician with a scalpel to help you. For before this next section of Scripture, chapter 6 and 7 are over, Gideon will indeed be commissioned and Israel will be freed from the hand of the Midianites. So never be bothered by a hard word from God. Whether that's tonight or any other time. Never be bothered by a hard word from God. That's not God's first step toward disowning you. That's God's first step toward delivering.